The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. The economic upheaval of the past six months exposed many gaps in our social safety net. Might it even prompt a major overhaul in tomorrow's speech from the throne? Tonight, we'll consider the prospects for a basic income and how it relates to the future of work. Then, we'll get the case for why governments should swing for the fences as they restart the economy. From the Monk School's director, Michael Sabia, who's also chair of Canada's Infrastructure Bank. It's Tuesday, September 22nd, and that's next on The Agenda. What's often called either a guaranteed annual income or a basic income is a policy idea that's been kicked around for decades. Ontario even did a partial pilot project under the previous government, but the arrival of this pandemic and the introduction of the CERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, well, that's accelerated the conversation around whether it's an idea whose time has come. Here to consider that and what it might do to the future of work and, as is our custom, we will introduce our guest from furthest away to closest to our studio, and that means we begin in Vulcan, Alberta, with Ken Bosenkuhl, research fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute. In the nation's capital, Miles Korak, professor of economics at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and in the west end of Ontario's capital city, there's Sunil Johal, a fellow with the Public Policy Forum, who in 2019 chaired the so-called expert panel on modern federal labor standards. And we're delighted to welcome the three of you to TVO tonight. I want to start, since the CERB is wrapping up at the end of the month, uh, with a little discussion about what's going to come next. And here is how a think tank called the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, this is what they would like to see happen next. The transition off of the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, CERB, will be an historic one, they say, likely the biggest transfer of beneficiaries from one program to another following the creation of the CERB in April. The timeline is tight and the stakes are very high. Without modifications, the end of CERB will result in 2.7 million people becoming worse off in the transition. Half a million of them will receive no post-CERB support at all. While this will squeeze many already tight household budgets, it is much better than the situation would have been without EI modifications and the creation of the new programs. Without them, an additional 2.1 million CERB recipients would be receiving nothing. Income supports are critical to individuals, but also to our country's economic stability and positioning for a recovery. Okay, let's get into this. Miles Korak, you know, of course, there's lots of uh, rumors coming out of Ottawa that the speech from the throne later this week is going to feature some kind of basic income or guaranteed annual income. Also, though, maybe even further, a further radical overhaul of Canada's income support system. Question, do you see that as a necessary step forward, given the pickle we're in right now? Without question, now is the time for social policy reform. Uh, COVID has taught us that there are some pressing needs that have to be met. They've been long standing. Um, a, a guaranteed annual income sort of speaks to those needs, but it's important to understand what those underlying needs are. What we need in the first instance is administrative simplicity. We need real time benefits to those who are, are struggling the most. We've always needed that. We need adequate income support. Uh, one of the things that we've learned from CERB is the importance of supporting the most vulnerable workers in our society. And the third thing deep down that a guaranteed annual income speaks to is a sense of ethical policies, a, a sense of being all in it together, um, income insurance for all. Uh, deep down, that's what the call for social policy is for, and it's now is the time. Okay, Ken, when you were on this program a number of months ago, you actually came out in favor of the emergency response benefit. Uh, you said we needed to help people get through the current crisis. Um, but the notion of a permanent guaranteed annual income, what's your view on that? 
Look, sometimes good policy in bad times is bad policy in good times. And at the beginning of the current crisis, we needed to shovel a whole bunch of money very quickly into people that were rapidly losing their jobs because of the economy being put into a coma. And just because that was the right policy for that time doesn't mean it's the right policy for good times. Uh, I like to say that uh, policy uh, poverty programs are complicated because poverty is complicated. And to, th and to think that the idea that a single program that just delivers income is going to work for a single male at 24 years old or a woman with uh, a single mother uh, or a uh, displaced worker at 55, to think that the same program is going to be equally effic efficient and good for all three of those people, never mind people with disabilities, I just I just can't get my head around that. So So again, I think good policy in bad times is not necessarily good policy in good times. So Neil, I guess we're gonna need you to break the tie. What say you? I, th I think, I mean, I would side with Ken that this isn't necessarily the approach that we're looking for in the longer term. Uh, the CERB played a role uh, in a crisis. We're not going to be in that crisis forever, knock on wood. Uh, but we do need, uh, as Miles said, a, a major refresh of our social policy architecture. I mean, whether you're looking at child care, affordable housing, retirement income security, skills training, um, all of those policy spheres uh, have been showing their age in recent years. And COVID's really uh, put a highlight on a number of those not being uh, adequate at all um, in the present day. So I think we need to look at uh, across the board, where do we need to refresh our social policy architecture? Basic income may play a part in that. Uh, it wouldn't be a universal basic income. That's not going to be affordable in the long term. Uh, but but I do think we, we're at a, a a real opportunity now to, to to modernize our framework for the 21st century in terms of social policy. Well, okay. Um, Ken and Tanil, humor me for a second while I go back at Miles here on on if if in fact the federal government decides that it wants to bring forward a basic income. Uh, Miles, we do remember that when Kathleen Wynne's government decided to go that route, they had a pilot program in three regions around Ontario, and it was about around $17,000 annual income uh, for a single individual. If the feds were to do something along that line later this week, unveil something like that, uh, how big, compared to the former Ontario program, which of course has since been cancelled, how big ought it to be? There's a lot in the design of basic income. And there are different versions of this. If people are talking about a universal payment to everybody, I don't think that's on the table. And it wasn't on the table in the vision of the former Ontario government. But basically, the federal government already has all of the building blocks it needs to fill in an important patch in our social safety net. We have a basic income for children. It's called the Canada Child Benefit. We have a basic income for older Canadians, the OAS and the GIS. What's missing in a big way is income support for people living on their own during their working years. And we have prototypes of that in place now uh, through the Canada Workers Benefit, through what's now called the Canada Recovery Benefit. And probably a reasonable uh, income level for the support in those programs would be tie it to the poverty line. The government. Uh, the federal government has passed legislation that um, that establishes targets for par poverty reduction, and the and the uh, the poverty line now varies between about twelve to sixteen thousand dollars across the country. So that's sort of the kind of income support, the ballpark figure that we're looking for. Ken, when you frame it that way, there are programs for seniors, programs for kids, programs for the disabled, programs for those who are without work. If you frame it that way. Do you still have the same objections to the notion of a guaranteed annual income? That actually is my objection. I like the program for children. I like the program for seniors. And we have programs for poor poor people in the provinces called welfare. And we have programs for unemployment called unemployment insurance. And while all of those programs ha can and should be improved, to think that we can replace all of them with a single check to families of a certain number or a single check to people of a certain number just strikes me as, as unhelpful. Um, there's no question. So, for example, Miles mentioned the, the wage subsidy. I think the, we can look at in, increasing the wage subsidy to help lower income working people. I think we can 
find and fill in some of the gaps that Miles has spent uh, an entire career identifying in employment insurance. So I think there are gaps in existing programs that we can fix without leaping to the idea that a universal payment to everybody uh, is the right answer to this. Uh, in social policy, I don't think efficient is the right answer. I think, uh, there, again, I said this earlier, our poverty programs are complicated because poverty is complicated. And that's a reality, and that's a good reality. We should have many programs to deal with many problems. Well, Sunil, you've been on this program many times in the past because you like to talk about, if I can put it this way, uh, like the real plumbing underneath policy choices that our politicians have to make. And, and I wonder if you could speak to this argument about efficiency and simplicity. A guaranteed annual income set at such a level that it would be simpler, cleaner, and potentially replace a lot of these other programs that have got myriad public servants operating them. Uh, do you see any value in that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, there could be some potential value in that. But the question is, at what cost are you um, developing or administering that efficiency or simplicity? I mean, many of the programs we're talking about are in place for a reason. They address a specified need in a certain population. Uh, if we got rid of some of those programs and just said, here's a here's a check every month for $1,000 or $1,500, uh, how's that going to benefit um, a lot of people who are still in need? I mean, core housing need, child care need, um, transit need. Uh, those things aren't going to be solved uh, by just handing people a check. I mean, it's like handing a bunch of people a shovel and saying, good luck, build a, build a highway to the next town. I mean, those things tend to work better when we collectivize them and we deliver universal public uh, programs. I mean, most people in Canada are spending somewhere between a third and a half of their income on um, on shelter. Um, I think we need to fix that broken market of housing right now across the country if we really want to uh, drive down the costs that people are facing, whether it's working people, people who aren't in the labor market, um, or others. Just handing people a relatively small check is not in the long run going to benefit uh, many of those people in the same way that developing a universal program um, or improving a universal program would. You know, um, well, let me put it this way. Let's, let's go right to the heart of what some see as the big political problem with the idea of a guaranteed annual income, and that is that it's somehow, and you'll forgive my use of this, this is what it used to be called back in the day, there's something... Uh, it would attack the so-called Protestant work ethic, uh, whereby we just don't pay people to stay home and do nothing. That's the argument. And I wonder how reasonable, Miles, maybe you want to start off, how reasonable a concern is that, that if, if governments were to pay people to essentially stay home to do nothing and get free money, as it were, you'd somehow be taking away the incentive to work. Well, that's an important concern, Steve, but let, let's be careful. I'm, I'm, I'm fearful that uh, Ken, Sunil, and I are talking uh, past each other here. Um, I'm not in the game that calls for, as you say, a universal payment to everybody to stay home and work. Um, that's not on the table. We want income support with engagement, and there are significant design features in the programs we already have that will both uh, give people support but encourage engagement. Um, so this idea that this is going to be one, a universal payment to everybody that will turn out to be inadequate and lead to significant disincentives to work, that's not the kind of programs that we have, and that's not what we're talking about. There are significant incentives designed for work, and these types of support programs, like the Canada Workers' Benefit, are actually argued for because they encourage work, they encourage a value for a job. Um, uh, so, and it's gradually, the benefit is gradually tapered away as you work more. So, for example, the recent Canada Recovery Benefit that the government uh, uh, announced has that feature. If you end up working more than, making more than $38,000, you start paying back the income. The point is, we need social supports that are simpler, that encourage agency amongst people, giving them access to support when they need it with dignity, and adequate support that can be designed in a way that doesn't create significant disincentives for work. So it's not an either-or thing, and it's not a universal payment we're talking about without any conditions. Ken, that is an argument I hear from conservatives a lot, though, that we can't do anything quote unquote, as a society to disincentivize people from working. Is that an argument you'd use here? 
I think the evidence of disincentives to work from people that have looked at it during the during the crisis is is been found wanting. I would turn this on its head and look at it a different way. When someone is on employment insurance, we have a whole bunch of aspects of employment insurance that encourage work. And I want to echo what Miles just said. And I think that those those things like reporting in, demonstrating that you're looking for work, being available for work, are all aspects of the employment insurance program that encourage people to get back into the labor force. And my, my concern here is that if we have a universal payment, that we don't lose, and again, Miles and I may be saying the same thing in a slightly different way, I don't wanna lose those aspects of existing programs that help people get back to work. And and the type of people that are on employment insurance and the type of supports that they get and the type of requirements we put on them to find work is different than the kinds of requirements we put on people on welfare and the people, the kind of supports that people on welfare need. People on welfare tend to be unemployed for longer periods of time, have much more uh, serious and different difficult issues and challenges that we have to deal with. And welfare programs tend to have different kinds of supports to help people get back into the labor force than the employment insurance system. And I think, again, that these programs are complicated because poverty and, and work and these things are, are complicated. And I just would not want us to move into a world where our poverty programs are, are too efficient easy to get and 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 not because it will discourage work but because it won't encourage work uh, on the other side well to that end uh, work is changing the nature of work is changing the kinds of jobs that are out there are changing uh, Sunil you've studied this a lot I wonder as as the Liberal government considers what it might want to roll out later this week what kind of idea what should they be keeping in mind as it relates to the changing nature of work if they're trying to design a new program yeah, I mean, most of the programs that we have in place in Canada currently tend to view work in a very 1950s binary um, type of model where you've got you're either full time employed or you're unemployed. The reality for many Canadians now is that they have multiple gigs or part time jobs or temporary jobs. You might lose one part time job, but you still have another one, but your income is taking a hit. Uh, so we need to kind of address those gray areas in between full time work and unemployment. Uh, and many of our current programs don't do that. So I think we need to start thinking about uh, income supports that act as true stabilizers and that if your income takes a 20 or 30 percent hit, we can stabilize you for a temporary period of time until you find another part time job, find another gig uh, job. That hasn't been historically how we've treated these types of programs in the past. Um, and I think going forward, that's going to be more of a more of an imperative for, for the federal government and for the provinces. Um, as well, because more and more people coming out of COVID are likely to be coming back to jobs that aren't permanent, aren't full-time, and are going to be more contingent types of work arrangements. And we need to make sure our social programs reflect that reality as well. So let me do a quick follow-up with you then. It, that suggests then that you would like to see something specific, targeted, and perhaps time-bound, as opposed to a universal new benefit that would be there, you know, pretty much for everybody, pretty much all the time. Fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair to say. I mean, as we've discussed, I mean, there's so many different ways you could define a basic income uh, that it almost becomes a meaningless exercise unless we kind of agree upfront what the parameters, what we're talking about are. I absolutely don't see a problem making sure people have a floor beneath which they don't fall. Uh, the question is, a lot of people are going to be bouncing up and up and down ab above and b beneath that floor at various times during their working uh, lives. How do we make sure in a targeted, quick way, if somebody falls beneath that floor that we think is uh, providing a level of decency or adequacy for people, that we can quickly get them back above it uh, and that we can make sure that they can bounce back into the labor market if that's a possibility. We can give them the skills training they need to uh, adapt to a rapidly digitizing labor market and world of work. Um, so again, I mean, I think it's kind of more targeted surgical interventions rather than a broad brush general approach that might work well for some people, but isn't going to address the specific needs that a number of different populations uh, experience. Miles, what would be your view on that approach? I like a lot of what Sunil has said, um, I, but I think the, the core message here is that we should be ensuring income, not jobs. Um, our, our employment insurance system is designed to cover periods of job loss, but there's a very dynamic model of, evolving. And in fact, the speak of the future of work is almost um, 
a bit passe, isn't it? I mean, we are now living the future <laughs> of work. Mm. It, uh, uh, it, this technology has been brought forward tremendously. Um, and I think Sunil's right. There's going to be a lot of contingency, increasing contingency in the labor market. Um, my own view is that uh, the federal government should start taking up that space that the provinces occupy of income support and leaving all of those uh, contingencies, those differences between people uh, to the provinces to provide in a whole host of different programs. But I think there's space here for the federal government to move and offer adequate income support across the nation for the group that we're missing, uh, the people that are on their own uh, or with a partner uh, uh, in their working ages. I would like our director, Sheldon Osmond, if he would, Sheldon at the bottom of page four, to bring up that chart on labor force participation rates, because this is a key thing that economists love to talk about. Labor participation rates referring to the percentage of the population that is either working or looking for work. And let's see how we compare. Uh, we're looking at a group of people between the age of 25 and 64. Obviously, those who work tend to work the most are in that demographic. Italy, 73 percent. The United States at 78 percent. Canada, 82%, Germany, 84%, look at Sweden, 89% labor force participation rates. Uh, at the risk, Ken, of uh, stating the obvious, why do you believe that is a significant metric that we should use to see how well we're doing? You know, if I had a billion dollars right now, uh, or two or four, or however many the federal government is going to spend, I'd be much more inclined to say we should invest this money into child care and child care supports. The tax support we currently give to child care is wholly inadequate. COVID has made child care provision very, very difficult, and I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. And so before I started speaking about a universal basic income, just to protect the numbers you just had on the screen, we're seeing that women, uh, the two groups that seems to me that are at greatest risk coming out of COVID are women because of the lack of childcare choices and the poor because they always suffer during recessions. And I think focusing on those two groups, uh, sorry, low income workers, so focusing on those two groups through a combination of, of childcare, changing the tax support to a refundable a refundable tax credit instead of a, a deduction that, that favors wealthy people, and then doing what Sean Spears been writing about wage subsidies to increase labor force participation among lower income people. I think those things are much more important than, than the universal basic income. And the reason, Sunil, that the uh, labor force participation number is so important in gauging the health of an economy is what? I prefer to have Miles answer that because he's the professor, but I'll take a crack at it. I mean, I think we want people <laughs> in the labor market. I mean, ideally, um, the best anti-poverty plan is getting people jobs and getting people involved in the labor market. I think some of the numbers you have up there mask the fact that we do have a lot of people who are distant from the labor market, have been um, removed from the labor market for a number of years, uh, and that's a concern. But I think just having a participation number doesn't necessarily tell the full story. What's the quality of those jobs? Are people being paid a decent wage? Uh, do they have opportunities for advancement? Are they being fulfilled in their jobs? Uh, are other factors we need to look at? Just kind of a pure how many people are in or out of the labor market, I don't think tells that uh, story. So, I mean, we, we also need a, a good jobs agenda here from the federal government and the provinces, too, and the private sector for that matter. I mean, the private sector is going to drive um, where the economy goes over the coming years, and we need to make sure that we're supporting uh, that through competitive marketplaces, strong labor standards, um, and a whole host of other uh, factors, not to mention things like productivity and innovation. So, I mean, this is a multi-layered uh, challenge and issue. It's not something the federal government or the provinces can come out with one policy and say, we've we fixed it. Uh, I mean, this is going to take concerted effort along a whole range of different uh, fronts. You know, for a guy who just wanted to punt that question, that's a pretty good answer, Sunil, so well done. But uh, yes, we should give the professor of economics a chance to go at this as well. I, I mean, it, 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 it won't be, Miles, I'm sure, as simple as to say Sweden's labor force participation number is much higher than Italy's, and therefore Sweden is a better, more equitable, fairer, whatever country than Italy. Um, but what does it indicate in your view? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I've learned a lot from, from Ken and Sunil, so thanks for that compliment, but uh, come on, guys. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think uh, what the, uh, the, the important point for me is also the difference between Canada and the United States. 
And I think this has to do with the way that our societies balance family with work. And um, both Ken and Sunil hinted uh, 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 at this. A little bit more flexibility in support, mainly for, for women, has given us a higher participation rate than the US, but not as much support as families get in Sweden, and why, that's why we're a little bit lower. Why does it matter? Well. Labor market engagement is one of the determinants of growth. There are two big determinants. Uh, the population, the quality of the skills, the engagement of the population. And the other is just the role of business and productivity and the changing technology and the business, business capacity to seize that technology and make it work for better jobs. And I think as we move forward, we should talk just as much about uh, the, uh, the investment patterns and the growth patterns and the technology and the ability of firms to produce good jobs as we should participation uh, uh, rates amongst uh, the population. Well, Ken, if I can draw an inference from this chart here, if we're at 82 percent labor force participation, that suggests, of course, that there's 18 percent of people, 25 to 64, who are you know, it's not happening for them right now. And I'd like to know from your side, I don't know if that's a, uh, you know, in, in this economy, in this day and age, is that a good number? Is that a bad number? Is it acceptable, unacceptable? I don't know. You tell me. Look, I know of a lot of people who uh, spend their life volunteering and they are maybe uh, have a life partner who uh, makes a lot of money that allows them to participate in the in the non-paid sector of our economy. And I'd never want to diminish the contributions of those people. So I would never want us to see 100 percent labor force participation. But certainly the the increase in women in the labor force has been a major component and their and, and the relative rise in income as they've been participating in the labor force has been a huge driver of economic growth, as Miles has just said. My concern is less do we get from 82 to 100. My concern is that we're going to go from 82 to 70 because we haven't got proper child, child care supports in the next little while. When you're starting to look at the, the, the little bit of recovery that we've had so far out of COVID, it looks to me like women and low-income workers are, going to, are at risk of losing labor force attachment. And I think the risk coming out of this crisis is not that we go from 82 to 84, but that we go from 82 to 75 and that women in particular are, are unable to join the labor force if we don't get the child care side of it right. Miles, do you see that as a genuine risk right now? Absolutely. I think Ken has hit it on the head. Ultimately, what determines participation rate is the flexibility uh, that you have to make choices, but also the wage rate. I mean, if, if wages aren't growing, people aren't going to be engaged in the labor market uh, to the same degree. So it's the quality of the jobs that matter as well. Hmm. So Neil, how about you? Is the 18 percent number? What does that, you know, what does that mean in Sunil Johal's world of whether the numbers match up or they don't? Yeah, I, I, I'm not concerned about the 82. I think, as Ken said, we, we're concerned about that backsliding, especially for uh, women. How do we make sure we have adequate childcare, affordable childcare, accessible childcare at a high quality level? That was a problem pre. COVID, it's only been exacerbated since. And the question is, how, when we come out of this pandemic, what does our child care system um, look like? And I think that's a huge area of focus that hopefully the throne speech does um, focus on. Well, it's interesting, Kim. We, we've been focusing a great deal. When I say we, I guess I mean, you know, media in general, political observers, that kind of thing. Uh, we've been getting so many signals out of Ottawa about the guaranteed basic income that may be an idea whose time has come. Um, but from what I'm hearing among the three of you, if they don't do something massive on childcare, um, what they have to say about a universal basic income uh, won't be nearly as significant. Have I got that right? I think that's exactly right. I mean, I've been writing about this for a while, for a number of weeks and months and years, that childcare is uh, as Sunil said, it was a problem before COVID, but it's really been highlighted. And I'm a little nervous about the language around a universal basic income and the lack of language around child care uh, in relative terms, as I've said already a couple times in the last half hour. If, in terms of the importance right now, I think child care is much more important than the universal basic income at this very moment. You've got a lot of sources in Ottawa. Do you, do you think they understand that? Um, you know, I, I, 
I'll just speak to Aaron O'Toole. I, I'm on the conservative side of the spectrum, as everyone knows. I've been a partisan in the past, and I was very encouraged to see Aaron O'Toole include a number of things on child care in his, in his program. Uh, the federal government has talked about child care. I'm a little worried that the tr they, they put a transfer in place and told the provinces to expect more money and then ended up in this terrible negotiation, and I think that actually slowed the the movement toward a rational child care system. I'd much rather see the federal government fix their their tax support for child care and have the provinces figure out how to how to improve provision. Uh, Jennifer Robson and I have written a number of things about this in the current context. Um, so I, I think they've heard it, but I think they've been they've they've seen a bit of a you know the movie where the, the dog sees a squirrel and runs off into the corner. I think the the liberals are a little bit distracted by the shiny bauble, and I worry that that uh, has distracted them from some of the some of the other challenges that are there well, uh, on the childcare side. You know, Miles, there is this expression that the poor will always be among us. I don't know that it's a you know it's not a very happy expression. It may not be a fair expression, but it's out there. And one wonders whether or not a liberal government intending to revolutionize the way that uh, income is supported in this country uh, can resist the opportunity to bring in something like a universal basic income. Again, we'll hear about it Wednesday uh, when the speech from the throat comes down. But, you know, regardless of how much education people have, regardless of how strong an economy has, um, presumably there are always going to be people who are left behind. It just seems to be the way it is. And therefore, is it not a fact that some kind of significant income support program is going to have to be there to help people have some modicum of dignity? Well, first of all, I don't agree with the fact that the poor will always be with us. You just gave us figures from a whole host of countries. And in Sweden and Finland and Norway, uh, poverty rates are much lower than in Canada. Child poverty rates are much lower than in Canada. Th that's a policy ch uh, choice. Clearly, what COVID revealed and exacerbated were important gaps in the fabric of our social safety net. And now is the time for the government to meet Canadians where they are now with programs that work for them, building upon what we have now. Sunil, I'll give you the last word on that. What say you? Yeah, I mean, 100% agree. We we choose the kind of society that we want. And we've seen in the midst of this pandemic, governments can make and private sector can make and citizens can make incredible choices and changes in what they do and how they do it to, to meet a challenge. And I think if we want to come out of this as a stronger society, we should we should say, why, why should we have um, poverty in our country? Why should we have challenges with childcare or skills training or pharmacare? Why can't we address all of these things in a way that makes sense and that uh, lifts the boat for all of us? I don't think that's a, that's a given, uh, that the poor will always be among us. We can, we can choose the future we want, um, but, it's, but it's going to take concerted effort and political will and public administration skill to develop the programs and services we need to get that done in a way that's fiscal um, feasible. It's not going to be easy, but it's possible. And I think we've got the, the smart folks in the country who can make it happen if we, if we put our minds to it. Well, we've had three pretty smart folks on the program tonight talking all about it. Sunil Johal with the Public Policy Forum, Ken Bosenkuhl, C.D. Howe Institute, Miles Korak, City University of New York. Uh, really good of all three of you to be with us on TVO tonight. And, and Ken, I'm so tempted. Should I do it? Where are you coming from, Ken? Vulcan, Alberta. Vulcan, and my, look how beautiful it looks. That is a beautiful view. And how can I not say to somebody coming from Vulcan, Alberta, live long and prosper, Ken. Actually, that should go for all of Thank us. Thank you. Take care, all. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Just days after the province declared a state of emergency for this COVID-19 crisis, Michael Sabia argued in the pages of the Globe and Mail that now is the time for governments to take bold action to reshape the economy. He is the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the U of T and chair of Canada's Infrastructure Bank. Six months into this unprecedented situation, are governments getting it right? Let's ask Michael Sabia, who joins us now from Montreal, Quebec. It's good to see you. It's good to meet you, actually. I don't think we've ever met before. Um, we're not exactly meeting and shaking hands or bumping elbows, but this is the next best thing in a pandemic. I want to um, 
hearken to that expression that the former Chicago mayor, Rahm Emanuel, uh, used, which you mentioned in your Globe and Mail piece, that, you know, you never want to let a serious crisis go to waste. Six months later, um, how are governments in this country doing at making that wish come true? Well, look, I think, um, I think if you look back for a moment, um, I think you have to say that um, governments in Canada have generally performed, uh, you know, pretty well. And when I say that, I mean, let's take this in two dimensions. There are the health issues, the protecting Canadians issues, uh, where, you know, if you compare our situation uh, to the real crisis in the United States um, or uh, the situation in a number of European countries, I think you have to say that governments have done a pretty good job, federal and provincial governments have done a pretty good job about that. And then if you look at the more economic dimension of this, and here I mean the relief measures that governments have taken to mitigate the impact of what was a uh, you know, an economic uh, shutting down an economy is a is an economic um, is a large scale economic crisis. And there, I think I'm probably understating. And there, the speed with which they moved, um, you know, all of that I think has been good. Now, and 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 because of that, I think we have seen some improvement in the economy uh, over the last few months, etc. As things have opened up. Now, the issue is looking forward. And here, I think, uh, you know, and I'm stealing a phrase here from the chairman of the Federal Reserve a few weeks ago when he said, it gets tougher from here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's right. It gets tougher from here because economies have opened in that spring that we got from opening up the economies. That's kind of behind us. We are facing some uncertainties around the virus itself. Um, and very importantly, very importantly, I think we're facing this issue about confidence, business confidence, consumer confidence, the willingness of consumers to spend, of businesses to invest, because that spending and that investment, I mean, that's the fuel that makes our economic engine go. Um, and right now, for I think quite understandable reasons, consumers are on the sidelines and businesses are largely on the sidelines. So the test I think the test for governments uh, that is now pretty much upon us is taking actions, developing plans to address that issue of confidence. And how do you do that? I think you do that through plans that drive growth, that create growth. Canada needs growth. Our growth potential is not what it should be. Uh, we're near the bottom of the G7. Uh, we're pretty low in the G20. We need to create growth because growth creates confidence. Confidence creates spending and investment. That makes the economic engine go. And second, finally, you know, growth also helps us uh, manage some of the debt that we've accumulated because if we can get our economy growing uh, at a reasonable rate, then that debt is going to become a, a smaller and smaller percentage of our total GDP. Well, a bunch of things to follow up on there. So let me let me start with debt and deficits, which you left off at. Um, you know, uh, I guess one of the things that's been astonishing through the course of this pandemic has been the real change in attitude that so many people have had toward deficits, which in the past so many people saw as evil. And now we've got a deficit approaching $400 billion dollars and you haven't got too many people out there saying that they're too concerned about this. Uh, the new finance minister, Christian Freeland, uh, recently tried to reassure the business community that prudent fiscal management is still something she cares about, knowing that the deficit is where it is. How would you interpret her statement on that? Well, I think it's a recognition that, um, you know, Canada, we are not a reserve currency. People don't need to own Canadian debt. Um, and therefore, addressing and ensuring market confidence is something that's important here uh, to ensure that there are markets for Canadian debt, that Canadian Canada continues to be an attractive place for, for foreign investment. Uh, so I, I give her credit for the comment and I think the commitment that it reflects, that the recognition that it reflects, that that issue is important. Now, that being said, uh, to come back to where your question started, 
I think a lot of things have changed. Um, and I think a lot of things have been changing for a while. It's not just all COVID related. Um, so, you know, is this an urgent pressing issue? Um, honestly, I think it is not. Um, now that being said, I think I come back to my first comment about maintaining market confidence. Obviously that's critically important. Um, so I'm not diminishing the importance of that, but I am saying that if you look at Canada's deficit or debt position, because I think the debt position is more important and you compare us to either the G20 or to the 40 largest industrialized uh, countries in the world, our debt to GDP is actually relatively good, um, relatively smaller, not small, but smaller. And as a very great investor, Mohamed El Arian, you know, once said, in a neighborhood where everybody has relatively dirty shirts, well, you're okay as long as your shirt is relatively cleaner because everything's relative. And you can't just buy German Bunds all day. You have to buy other kinds of, of, of debt. So on a relative basis, you know, I think Canada's position uh, is manageable. And then my final comment would be, I think if you look ahead, you know, what does that reflect? I think it reflects the market's judgment around inflation because that has changed fundamentally. And it's changed fundamentally uh, because of, you know, there's very little pressure on wages. Now that may be a bad thing from an equity point of view. So I'm not suggesting I think that's a good thing, but from an inflation point of view, it does keep inflation down. That's, that's one thing. Second, global growth rates are relatively modest. So there's not much pressure there. Third, um, we live in, a, in an economy where value is created through intangibles, through knowledge, and that's less, each unit of growth, if you will, is less capital intensive than it was. We, we live in a world where there's basically a savings glut in the world, and those deficits help soak those things up. So that's all to say that the outlook for inflation, and central bankers across the world have been saying this, is for very, very modest inflation going forward. So when I look at the whole thing, I say, well, you know, if I had a choice between dealing with the deficit of, of weak infrastructure or the deficit of a digital divide or the deficit of, of significant social inequality, those are all deficits that matter. And I think addressing those right now is at least as important uh, as managing our fiscal situation, which I think, as I said, on a relative basis, is manageable. All right, let me pick up on the growth angle that you touched on in your first answer. You're now chairing the Infrastructure Bank, and I wonder if you could just tell us what role you see it playing in encouraging that growth that you think is so necessary for the future of the country. Um, well, look, I think in lots of ways. Um, you know, just a word on, on the bank. Um, you know, what is it? Because I think a lot of people don't really know what an infrastructure bank is, and and you know, understandably so. Uh, you know, traditionally, governments fund infrastructure by writing a check, by providing a grant. They pay 100% of it, and of course, in that kind of context, they don't get their money back. The bank is different. Uh, what we do is we provide uh, low-cost financing so that we try to push projects through a viability threshold so that we actually get those projects done. And second, we always do it with an eye to bringing in private capital. And there are enormous sources of private capital in the world looking to invest in steady assets like infrastructure. So every dollar of money coming from the bank is matched by one dollar or perhaps two dollars coming from others, which increases the magnitude, the size of everything that we can, we can do. And then third, we always want to get our money back so that we keep investing, we get a flywheel of investment underway. Now, so I think it's an efficient way to get infrastructure built. And building infrastructure right now is extremely important. It's extremely important because as we just discussed, you know, governments do have to manage um, their overall fiscal situations, number one. And we're, I think, a more efficient way of doing it from a financial point of view. It's super important from a jobs and productivity point of view. Infrastructure is one of the best ways of improving uh, national productivity. And what's growth? Growth is just increase in the labor force and productivity. So it's super important 
uh, there. And finally, it's an opportunity uh, to help us shape the future of our economy. If you like, infrastructure is a bit like a, I don't know, it's like a skeleton. Um, and if you can modernize that or adapt that, then you can shape the future of our economy and you can shape the future growth potential of our economy. So, you know, those are some of the things that we're trying to accomplish at the bank. And we're going to do that through, you know, investing in the expansion of broadband so that people are connected to broadband. The, the, the COVID crisis has certainly taught us that that's not a luxury. We're going to do it uh, with a focus on climate change and, and um, building retrofits and, and, and cleaner commutes uh, through renewables. Um, we're going to do it through things like um, expanding irrigation uh, in Canadian agriculture, large-scale irrigation, because that makes that more productive, helps our exports, helps secure the future of Canadian agriculture. There's a whole range of things we can do that both create jobs now, which we need, but at the same time have a constructive long-term impact on the growth potential of the Canadian economy. One of the reasons we've been anxious to have you on this program is not just to talk about what we've just talked about, but to also get you to take that hat off and put your monk school hat on because post-secondary is going through cataclysmic change right now. And, you know, you're the director of the monk school, which is a beautiful bricks and mortar institution in downtown Toronto. The building looks gorgeous. The stuff that happens inside that building is important to the future of the country. But I wonder how much this pandemic has changed our view about how much bricks and mortar educating we need going forward and how much of this is actually going to move online forever. Do you have thoughts on that? Um, well, look, I'm, uh, I'm new at the higher education business, so I'll be cautious in my response. Um, look, I think online education, and we spent a lot of time uh, at the school over the last number of months on this issue, um, preparing in the best possible way and trying to be creative about, um, about how we do it, about producing content in the same way that you and your profession produce content for, for, for television. And I think through that process, you know, we've, we've discovered lots of things. We've discovered the potential of creating global classrooms. I mean, we're a school of global affairs and public policy. So having access to people around the world being part of a global conversation that uh, online uh, techniques allow us to do. Those are positives. Um, and, and the ability it gives us to reach out, those are all positives. Now, that being said, and you know, I think generally, we need to be very careful. Yes, we're in the middle of an extraordinary event and it understandably attracts a very large percentage of our attention. We're all very much focused on this. But I think we need to be cautious in assuming that what is happening today because of the measures that are needed to manage the pandemic are necessarily fixtures for the future. I'm skeptical about that. Will it change the fundamental way we do things? I'm, again, I'm skeptical. I doubt that. So online learning, online outreach, global classrooms, will they have a role to play going forward? Yes, they will. But are they going to replace the richness of students being together in a classroom with a professor, exchanging views, debating ideas, developing creative solutions to some of the world's greatest problems? I hope I don't not. Think so. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. In the same way that, you know, there are people today who say, oh, God, downtown, that no one will go downtown anymore. There won't be meetings in office buildings anymore. I don't agree with that. We'll get back. We'll recover from this. We'll recover the rhythm of life that we all grew up with. Will some things change? Yes, some things will change. But being with people, exchanging with people, that's part of who we are. 
And I think that's I think that's going to happen whether it's in a law firm, an investment business like the one I used to be in, or in a school like the Monk School at U of T. Well, let me do a quick follow-up on this because I think at the University of Toronto, fully a quarter of the students last year were foreign students, meaning they came from other places in the world and they paid inflated tuitions, which allows, of course, domestic students to keep our uh, tuition costs much lower. And 60% of those foreign students came from China. And we're not getting along with China all that well these days. So I wonder how concerned you are about a scenario where China just decides, you know what, we're not sending any more students to Toronto. And what does that do to the bottom line of the U of T and the Monk School? I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think the, the Chinese authorities are far too smart for that. Uh, I think they're, they're rightly focused on the future of their country and how they can enhance that future to the maximum possible degree. One of the ways of doing that is uh, having talented Chinese students attend uh, great universities, be it at the University of Toronto, be it uh, Oxford or Cambridge, be it Harvard or Stanford or Chicago. Um, and I think the, the Chinese are very good at understanding what works for them, and I think they're going to continue to to want to do that because it is in their interests, and I, and it is in our interest that that happens. Uh, so, in my opinion, this is something that works both for the Chinese and for, in this case, the University of Toronto or Canada. Um, why do I say that? I say that because China it will be the world's largest economy. And as Canadians, we are going to have to work with that reality because it's an undeniable reality. And we are going to have to find ways of working with the Chinese, of exchanging with them. Yes, there are going to be some things that we disagree about. Human rights issues are obvious. The situation in the immediate term of the two Michaels is obviously a major, major issue. But beyond that, down the road, China will be one of, it will, its rivalry with the United States is going to restructure how the global order works. And as Canadians, we need to be part of that. We need to be linked in um, with China. We need to be able to exchange with them. Students coming here, that's part of it. But I think we also need to think more broadly about the technology issues, about the climate issues, et cetera, because China's not going away. And as Canadians, we're going to need to find ways of working constructively with the Chinese and them with us. Hmm. Michael Sabre, we're down to our last few minutes here. And um, I don't know you at all. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and do something uh, a little cheeky. Um, and that is that I'm going to ask you about something that I suspect you haven't been asked about in an interview in a very, very long time. And that is, you know, one of the most impressive, forceful, feminist conservatives I ever met, and we're going back 40 years now, was a woman named Laura Sabia, who was your mother, who was really a force of nature. And I know there are, there's a whole generation of younger people in this country who don't know who she is, but I've got her son sitting here on TVO tonight, and I want you to talk about your mom and what she was, first of all, what she was like as a mother, and to, and to watch your mother be one of the very early feminists in this country do her thing. Um, well, one, it's very kind of you to to remember her. So uh, so thank you for that because I, as you can imagine, very much uh, very much remember her. In answer to your first question, she was um, she was she was great. Um, I mean, she was really great. Um, so in terms of what kind of a mother was she? I mean, she was terrific um, and lots of fun. Um, you know, more broadly, in terms of sort of the impact that she had um, on me, uh, I mean, I like to think that she had an impact in advancing rightly the cause of, of women, because when you think back into those days, my goodness, women were in a different situation than they are are today. So if she contributed in some small way to improving that, that was great. But in terms of me, you know, my mother, um, 
one of the things that motivated my mother was that she just refused to accept being the object of discrimination. And she experienced that, I think, in two ways, both being uh, of Italian descent, uh, which in those days uh, still brought with it uh, discrimination, and second, being a woman, where clearly in those days women were, were discriminated against. And she fought that really all her life. Um, and it's, as many other people do, um, coming from similar backgrounds or different backgrounds, it's not, you know, she wasn't unique, and I'm certainly not. Um, and that, you know, the impact that that had on me, watching her do that, and as I got older, becoming more conscious of that, I think what, and this was a great gift she gave me. Um, I mean, that sort of fight, that resolution on her part, um, that got passed down to me in a kind of, I don't know, a, for, a kind of being determined, um, you know, never really being satisfied that you've done the job well enough, um, you know, always a kind of sense of you need to do better, um, you need to contribute more, uh, you need to find a way to make the job better uh, than, than, than it is. That determination has been a, a huge gift to me. And um, and again, I don't say that because I think I'm, I'm special or unique. I think that's true for a lot of people who come from either immigrant backgrounds or from uh, people who are wrongly discriminated against. Um, but that had, a, that had a very, very important impact on me. Well, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit in as much as your mom was special and was unique. And I'm really glad that I got a chance to meet her and interview her back in the day and her son tonight on TVO. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. That's Michael Sabia. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, September 22, 2020. Rarely has U.S. politics been as tumultuous and unpredictable as it is in the run-up to this presidential race. Tomorrow we'll ask, is it time for Canada to consider what a truly destabilized America would mean for us? I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, Steve Pakin's blogs, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily.